Uh, some of you have wanted to know how I'm processing the grief of the Buff Buffalo Bills loss last Sunday. And some of you thought I was there. Actually, I was driving back from New Hampshire. I had spoken at a men's retreat, and I did not see even a single minute of the game, which turns out was a blessing in disguise. And uh, so, yeah, here we are. Uh, uh, just something to make you aware of. Well, two things, actually. One is, I've just been informed that uh, we are about to be a... Uh, our grandparents again. Yeah. You're, you're cheering like I had something to do with that. <laughs> I did not. I think you know, uh, I, I, the way I talk about it is, is that uh, grandparenting is way easier than parenting, but just as expensive. <laughs> and uh, so we've got to start budgeting for that. And then uh, uh, we're coming up uh, in February an important uh, action is taken by the members of our church family. And uh, one of the responsibilities that members carry is to select the next person who will serve on our church council. And that's a governing body that oversees our finances and our ministries. And so uh, we, uh, the outgoing individual is Stephen Mao. And I can't tell you how much respect I have for the uh, gifts that he's brought to the table and uh, the, the incredible wisdom of his counsel. I'm so grateful for him being there. Uh, we have two individuals that uh, our church family will select from, and uh, the first is Emmanuel Bradley, the second is Alphonse Sasso. I can tell you that these are both uh, godly individuals who have served as elders in our church, and this is what we ask people to do. We don't ask you to go to your friends and say, what do you know about them? We ask you to go in prayer and say, God, who do you think would be the best person to sit in the chair given what our church is going to face in the next three years? And, and we don't know what that is, but God does, and God can put the right person in the right place at the right time for the right reason. How many are grateful he can do that? So we think when we play politics, we get political responses, but when we pray, we actually think we get God responses, and so I would encourage you to do that. All right. I did not start my timer until now on purpose. Um, in Matthew, uh, we are in chapter uh, 11. We're actually going to look through all of chapter 11 and part of chapter 12 today. It's a pretty large undertaking, uh, but there's some things I want to talk about, and, and one has to do with doubts. Um, why do we experience doubt and where does where the source of doubt come from? And then, then secondly, um, rejection. Why do people reject Jesus? And then thirdly, why is Jesus so controversial, not only in his day but ours? And uh, this passage of Scripture just yields unbelievable insight into those three things. And so beginning in chapter 1, it says, after Jesus had finished instructing the 12 disciples, this is a really important phrase, and it shows up five times in Gospel of Matthew. He uses it strategically after a significant teaching. So he uses this phrase after the Sermon on the Mount. He's just completed his sermon on mission, so he uses it here. He's going to do a sermon on parables. He'll use it there. He's going to do a sermon on the church, who we are, why we're here. He'll use it there. And then he'll do a sermon on um, the end times and he'll use it there. So it's always a phrase. You, if you want to know what the major teachings of Jesus was in Matthew, just look for this phrase when you go through it. And he went up from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee when John, and, and he's referring to John the baptizer, when John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? And Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. It's not just unbelievers or non-believers who wrestle with doubt. 
We think people who don't buy into some of the things that we believe or come to places like this on days like this, they're the doubters and, and we're the ones that don't struggle with doubt. But that's not exactly true. John the Baptizer is a significant spiritual influence in his generation. And according to Jesus, one of the, one of the truly great prophets of all time, like that, that's a hard uh, class to crack into. And, and that's what Jesus says about him. And his response to Jesus is, are you the one who's coming or should we look for someone else? And why is he starting to doubt? And, and the first answer is, is because Jesus is not meeting his expectations. Uh, this can happen. Uh, God doesn't always do what we want him to do when we want him to do it. How many have already figured that part out? If your hand's not up, then I've got bad news for you. Yeah. And uh, if you look at the messages of John, there were three words that he really loved. Repent. <laughs> that was one. Uh, fire. He loved the word fire. And then axe. He, he would, a lot of his messages were, you better repent and you better separate the wheat from the chaff what's going to be usable and what's going to be thrown away because the Messiah is coming and he's going to burn up the chaff. And you better start producing fruits of righteousness because every tree that doesn't, the ax is already laid at the root of the tree and those trees are coming down. So he expected Messiah to walk in with a fire torch in one hand and an ax in another. Look like a Marvel superhero coming in, kicking down doors and taking names. And, and then he hears, did you notice? When he heard about the deeds of Jesus, he sent his disciples. Are you the one that's coming? Or should we look for someone else? Because he expected Jesus to behave very differently. And there's another reason that he doubts, and that is that his life is in a personal crisis. You probably noticed it. he's in prison. He's in prison for a reason. That the political leader of his time was Herod Antipas, and Herod was guilty of marital infidelity. Herod just took whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted it. And so uh, he had engaged in marital infidelity and taken someone that did not belong to him, in fact, was married to someone else. And uh, John the baptizer had something to say about that, and, uh, and he winds up in jail. And by the way, things are not going to get better for him. He's not getting out. Well, he's going to get out, but he's going to go to a grave without his head attached. He's going to be beheaded. So he's in a crisis. And it's, it's very easy for us when we're in a crisis to think, I was trying to serve God. Why have things gotten worse for me? And that's a source of doubt. So when God doesn't meet our expectations, it can give rise to doubt. When we're going through a hard time after we were trying to do the right thing, uh, that's a source of doubt. And Jesus gives an interesting response to the disciples of John who came to him and asked this question. Uh, by the way, there's another thing in here. Because he has these expectations and Jesus isn't fulfilling them, maybe this is also a way for him to tell Jesus, you, you need to get about your job now. Should we be looking for someone else? I mean, if, if your employer came to you and said that, you would think, I need to buckle down or I need to brush up my resume. Right? And... Uh, so this is what Jesus says to the John's disciples. Tell them what you see and what you hear. First of all, I'm interested that he didn't say, tell them what I'm doing. And I don't know quite what to make of that. Tell them what you see and tell them what you hear. And what you have to realize is for a lot of Eastern religions, there is a concept that seeing and hearing is actually an antithesis of a spiritual life. In fact, Plato absolutely distrusted our physical being. This is what he said. He said, surely the soul can best reflect when it is free of all distractions such as hearing or sight or pain or pleasure of any kind. That is when it ignores the body and becomes as far as possible independent in its search for reality. That somehow it's only the things we sense internally that are true and what we see and what we feel and what we hear are deceptive in some way. And so Jesus kind of busts through that concept of spirituality 
And it's, it's frustrating. If you, can, you can even compare that with uh, what one of his own disciples, uh, the Apostle John, said in 1 John, the first chapter. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This is what we proclaim, the word of life. Like, that's a very powerful thing. What we've seen, what we've heard, what we've touched. Now, there's another reason that we can doubt God, and that is that sometimes we doubt things because we can't actually control things. Right? Now, th this isn't complicated. If, if you went home and you turned on the light switch and nothing happened, uh, you would have a series of questions. Is the power off in the rest of the house? Has the light burned out? Is there something wrong with this particular fuse? Like, something's not working, and so then we have doubts about what else might work. It, it's a very common way to think about life. And Jesus identifies that this is part of what's going on. Look in the uh, uh, beginning in verse 16. To what can I compare this generation, he says. They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you, but you did not dance. We wanted to have a party. You're not partying. We sang a dirge. You did not mourn. There was something we were sad about. You're not acting sad. And then he clarifies what and who he's talking about. For John neither came eating or drinking, and they said he has a demon. Uh, John, John was made for our generation. He definitely would have had a YouTube channel and millions of followers. Like this guy wore strange clothes, and he ate bugs dipped in honey. You just, you can't, you can't be ignored when you do that. And like I said, repent and fire and the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. This is a really interesting concept. There's something about the human condition that isn't looking for what they like. They look for what they don't agree with. And John, he's just too harsh. He's just too strong. He's, you can't do anything with that guy. And, and they don't just stop with, I don't get him. They go to, he has a demon. That's quite a jump. And then Jesus comes along, and he looks normal in his dress, and he sits at the table with everybody else, and he laughs at the jokes that are told, and, and, and he gets along with everybody, and they don't like him either. You can't take a guy seriously who hangs around with people like him. The problem actually wasn't John or Jesus. The problem was the filters and the perceptions that we carry around in our lives. And it is always easier to look at anything and anyone and find fault. It's just so easy to do. And then you would think that with Jesus, I mean, we don't have any recorded miracles of John the baptizer, but, but Jesus has recorded miracles. And in fact, in chapters eight and nine of Matthew, there are 10 miracles that Jesus performs. So a lot of people say this, if I saw a miracle, that would erase my doubts. I would believe. Let's find out. Matthew 11, chapter 20. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. How can this be? Most of his miracles. Woe to you, Chorazan. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, that's the equivalent of just the places you go where there's no filters, very few rules, and you can do what you want. Big cities. We have our modern equivalents. He said, if those miracles had been performed there, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, Will you be lifted up to heaven? That was their branding, their motto. Like if you're from Webster, Webster, where life is worth living, it's more like Capernaum, lifted up to heaven. That was their motto. And I said, no, you, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than you. What, what is going on here? Won't miracles change people's mind? And the answer is no. 
They don't. Because even when you see something you can't explain, that's not the same thing as saying, I see something that makes me believe. We bring a set of assumptions, a set of perceptions to our interactions with Jesus. And so the doubts were not assuaged, even by the things that Jesus said and did, his miracles. And then he actually says something that causes people to reject him. And this is what you should know about why people reject Jesus. They can give a lot of reasons, but the real reason is, is what he claims. People reject Jesus because of what he actually says. Verse 27, it says, all things have been committed to my father, to me by my father. No one knows the son except the father and no one knows the father except the son and those to whom the son chooses to reveal him. You can't know God without me. And it's this exclusivity and it still drives people crazy. Which, this is what you should know, though, is that there are lots of people, particularly in the modern culture, who say that's the problem with Christianity, is it's just too exclusive. And you just have to come a certain way. And what you need to know is that everyone who claims that someone else is exclusive is doing it from a position of exclusivity. You know, you've probably heard someone say like this, well, I think... Uh, they always sound so smart when they say this. Well, I think that every religion has some truth. And I think that if you get all the religions together and you kind of, of combine them, that, that's when you get a, a real picture of what real spirituality looks like. And, and that doesn't sound exclusive at all. Except what is the person saying? Until all the religions get together, and all the religions can get along, and everyone can see the truth that I see, then we'll have real spirituality. It's an exclusive claim. And so there are people who really struggle with this idea. So what, what are we to do with Jesus? And this is what we need to understand about the exclusive claims of Jesus. Jesus did not say, if you do not come to me, you cannot know about God. Jesus did not say, if you do not come to me, you cannot be a good person. He did not say, if unless you're a Christian, you're not a moral person, or you're not a loving person, or you're not a generous person. There are people who don't go to churches. They don't believe in God. They, they don't have any faith or any religion. They love their spouses. They take care of their kids. They pay their taxes. They're generous and they help other people. There are lots of people who think all Christianity is, is a morally superior religion so that from our perch, we can feel accepted by God and look down on others. And that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying you can know a lot about God. You can read a lot about God. You can do some very good things, but that's not the same thing as knowing God. The only way we know God is through Jesus. So, and we understand this, right? You can say, well, I know so-and-so because I looked them up on social media. Okay. What you saw was what they showed you and what other people said about them. And if you haven't had any interaction with them and you spend too much time looking stuff up on them, it's called stalking. <laughs> stalking God is not the same thing as knowing God. Knowing where someone was born, where they went to school, how they did this, what kind of money they make, what their preferences are, what they like to eat. This does not mean you know the person. The way you know a person is to have conversations with the person. Do you want to have a conversation with God? Good. Jesus will introduce you himself and you can start being part of his family immediately. Isn't that good news? That's great news. What happens when people do that? Verse 28, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Rest. Because if our goal is to earn our own salvation, which is every other salvation plan outside of Jesus, you either wind up with a lot of pride or a lot of guilt, but you never wind up with rest. 
Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Now, you would think religious people would kind of sign on to this, but they didn't. Here's the guy who performs the works of God. He speaks the words of God. And you would think they would come along, but they don't. They start finding fault too. And in chapter 12, it says, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath and his disciples were hungry and began to pick some of the heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, look, your disciples are do doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. And Jesus responds, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry. He entered the house of God and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do so, but only for the priests. And have you not read in the law, the priest on the Sabbath, on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath. They're actually doing work yet. Are they not yet innocent? And I tell you something even greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, and he quotes the prophet Isaiah, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Would you not have condemned? You would not have condemned the innocent for the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. <laughs> this is a problem. And it's a problem that we're going to face at some point in our life. What had they done? The religious people had focused on a command that said you should not do work on a Sabbath. And then they thought of all the ways that they did things that felt like work to them. And then they outlawed it for that day. And the problem was, is that they only paid attention to their understanding of one verse and they didn't read much further in scripture. And they wound up misusing scripture. This is what happens if we don't have a well-balanced view of scripture. We will get very hot and bothered about one part of it. And then Jesus will come along and said, yeah, how does that connect with this part of scripture and this part of scripture? And so he said, what about David going in and eating bread? David, there was a political assassination on his life. Uh, King Saul wants to kill him just because he's more popular than King Saul. And he's running and they're hungry, they're starving. They come into a, a place where there's a, a religious center set up and, and David and his men take the bread and there's nothing in that story that indicates that God disapproved of that. And there are places where it talks about the work that's being done by the priests in the house of God and God doesn't disapprove of that. And Jesus is saying, if you're going to get passionate about one part of scripture, you better know the rest of scripture. Because if you don't, all you do is create guilt and you create condemnation and you add burdens to people's life and you create division. And so, so and, and then he says, this is what uh, scripture says, I desire mercy over sacrifice. What is he saying here? This is really interesting. For Jesus, he understood what the heart of his father was about the Sabbath to begin with. And the Sabbath was about freedom. For 600 plus years, the nation of Israel had lived in bondage in Egypt. They never got a day off. Every single day you got up, and if you didn't meet the quota, you got the, the uh, wrong end of a whip. Like life was not good, no days off. And so what, what God does at Mount Sinai when the law is given, he says, you get a day off. You're not slaves anymore. And what I will tell you is, if we're not taking any days off, it's because we're a slave to something. I could talk longer about that, but I'm running out of time. And I know some of you are so grateful. He says, I desire mercy over sacrifice because the goal of honoring the Sabbath was not to treat it as a burden to be born and a sacrifice to be made. It was to be treated as a gift to be enjoyed. God has poured blessings into your life. At least one day a week, you should be able to relax and to enjoy the incredible things that God has given to you and celebrate them. Does that sound like a good idea to you? 
Yeah. So they're treating it like a sacrifice. And Jesus says, you, you got it wrong. And, and so, so mercy might be the way you go about this. And here's two questions that I think are interesting to consider. And the first is, what would mercy look like if you were showing it to somebody else? What would mercy look like if you were showing it to yourself? Because some of us can actually do the mercy to someone else thing. But we beat ourselves up in ways that's very hard to describe. So the Sabbath is about freedom, but the Sabbath is also about health. Look at what it says. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And he said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, Will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. The Sabbath helps us to stay free, the Sabbath helps us to stay healthy. Our tendency is to overwork, overeat, and overreact. If there's one thing Western culture knows how to do, is to go over the top on everything. And we need this break into our lives. And what Jesus understands is that the reason God added a Sabbath to our lives is to make us healthier, not to carry a heavy burden. If you go back to the days of Western expansion into our country, and there was a gold rush out in California, wagon trains would form to make this very treacherous and long journey. And they actually had two wagon trains leave at the same time, and they were going out west to make their fortune. And one wagon train decided, no days off. We want to get to our goal. We want to get to our dream. We want to find our goal. We want to build the life we always wanted. No days off. And the other wagon train said, every seventh day, we're going to stop and we are going to rest and we're going to rest our animals. Guess who got to California first? It wasn't even close. The people who rested. It's healthier. It's healthier. So Jesus tells him, he said, if a sheep fell into a pit, you'd help the sheep. But if a human is struggling, you won't help them. Why is it not work for a sheep? And it is for a person. Because a lot of us think anything we do for people is work. That's a problem. And if I were Jesus right here, I'd have played a very different card. I'm regularly reminded I'm not Jesus. If I were Jesus, I'm going to have the worship team come out. If I were Jesus, I would have said, Sir, I've got really good news for you. In just a few hours, the sun is going to set, and when it does, Sabbath is over. And I will meet you at this specific location. And no longer will you have to, to struggle with only being able to carry what one hand is able to carry. You'll have complete strength and complete mobility in both your arms. In just a few hours, everything is going to change for you. And it feels like it would have kept everybody happy. The Pharisees would go, well, yeah, he's honoring the Sabbath. And the guy would go, I, I, I've gone this long. I can go a little longer. So why not do it? And it's because of the the underground message that teaches people. It's that a person who's struggling and unable to function is not as important as a day on the calendar. And to God, it's never been true. And Jesus wasn't going to reinforce that kind of thinking. That guy shouldn't have to go one more minute of suffering. I'm here. God is here. Why have to go one minute more? Stretch out your hand. An instant healing. That was enough 
to create a desire to destroy Jesus. But Jesus will not back down. He will not let us misunderstand the heart of God at any time. Why? When you know the heart of God, you can be Lord of the Sabbath. And until you know the heart of God, it's all going to be confusing, perplexing, a burden to be born and a sacrifice to make. How many are grateful that the heart of God doesn't require for a special day on the calendar for His grace to break through into our lives and His power to be released and our lives to be made whole again? That's what He does. That's what He does. Would you bow your heads? Whatever the area is in your life, it could be relational fracturing. It could be financial lack. It could be a physical challenge. It could be an emotional struggle. It could be an ongoing dependency on something that has more control of your life than you have of it. Whatever it is, if you're in the house this morning, I think Jesus is here too, and he's Lord of the Sabbath. And this is what he's saying to us. Stretch forth your hand. So whatever your need is, would you be willing to do that? Would you just stretch forth your hand and let's see what our loving Heavenly Father might release into our lives today. Just stretch it right forth. Father, you see these hands. You're not waiting for a day on the calendar. You are right here. You are right now of able to do all that we ask or think and beyond that. And so we ask your grace to be released into each and every life. And Father, for those today who maybe have known about you and they've done their best to live good lives, would you help them not settle for that? Would you help them enter into a relationship with you today? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand this morning.